back in 33 or so, Casey giving a reading said, there's much sadness in China today. They were having challenges. Remember, China and Japan were at war during those times. And I'm reminded of that as I think about our present situation. People in Houston, you know, we, we here experience our pain. Just imagine what, what it must be like to have felt like you've lost everything. And then California is on fire and the southeast is flooding. So let's take a minute to invite the angels to surround those people in those conditions. A minute of quiet. Lord, we pray that you'll send a host of angels to those who are suffering at this time in this country and around this planet. And in this awareness of need, help us personally to resolve, to seek to lead lives of greater attunement and greater service. In his name, amen. Well, I want to talk with you about um, the concept from the Casey readings, uh, as a tree falls. Actually, the expression comes from a kind of obscure passage in Ecclesiastes 11. It says, If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree falls toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall be. And the, again from the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes, When they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be on the way, and man goeth to his long home. Interesting. When man goes to his long home, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So the idea of um, the tree falling where it lies and uh, the golden bowl and the silver cord picked up specifically in the Casey readings from the introduction to search for God. There are spiritual centers in our bodies which are points of physical contact between the physical organism and the soul. These connections are just as real as the nerve centers and fibers which carry impulses from one of the sense organs to the brain. There is a bowl that must one day be broken and a cord that must one day be severed from the physical body in each individual experience. The ultimate goal of each soul searching is a greater awareness of God. Through meditation, we may increase this awareness in our daily life and prepare the way for the change called death to bring us another step toward the goal. So this bowl that must be broken and the cord that must be cut, again, from the Search of God Introduction to Meditation. When we attune ourselves to the infinite, the glands of reproduction may be compared to a motor which raises spiritual power in the body. This energy rises up. It's the generator. This spiritual power enters through the center of the cells of Leidig. This center is like a sealed or open door according to the use to which has been put through our spiritual activities. With the arousing of the image or ideal, this life force rises along what is known as the Appian Way or the silver cord to the pineal center in the brain where it may be disseminated. And then 
Later, during the rising of the currents along this silver cord and these centers, a body may become of these, aware of these vibrations. So the idea of the tree falling where it will, the tree lies where it falls. Um, Van mentions watching the um, Alaskan bush people. In one episode, they need wood, and so they clear a way to fell a tree. And then the father wants his son to do this. He says he needs to learn how to do this. So the idea is that the tree has to fall in that clearing so that they can drag it out where they can uh, work on it and saw it into usable pieces. If the tree lies where it falls, and that's addressing us as we transition, then maybe we need to take aim and, and make sure it falls in a way that can work for us. And the determination of that fall, that aim, is with respect to our ideals and our spiritual goals. Learn this lesson well of the spiritual truth. Criticize not unless you wish to be criticized. For with what measure you meet, it is measured to thee again. It may not be in the same way, but you cannot even think bad of another without it affecting thee in a manner of a destructive nature. You can't even think bad without it affecting you in a destructive nature. Think well of others, and if you can't speak well of them, don't speak. But don't think it either. Now why is this so? Because our thoughts affect our spiritual centers, and we are co-creators, and with our thoughts we are building ourselves. As we think ill of others, we simply build a pattern within ourselves, a vibratory pattern, with which we eventually will have to deal. What one thinks continually, they become. What one cherishes in their heart and mind, they make a part of their pulsation of the heart. Through their own blood cells and build into their own physical that which its spirit and soul must feed upon and that with which it will be possessed when it passes into the other realms. Get this clear. That that we think we build into the cells and that is that with which our soul and spirit will be possessed when we move into other realms. So the, the idea of the tree falling Anne and I, I think in the past three years, have conducted more memorial services than we did in the previous 30. The implications of that don't need to be discussed. <laughs> and so what I want to talk with you about is to make sure the tree falls in a direction that will be profitable for all of us. One of the problems is we don't have a real sense of time. We, we think, oh, life, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, maybe maximum 115 or something. And, and that's about it. We think, well, the life is over and that's it. That's what the church has taught us. And uh, <clears throat> they, someone said, no one has ever painted an interesting picture of heaven. The church just says, believe and you die and you go to heaven. And so what's promising about that? Are there realms of excitement and joy and fulfillment and rejoicing that are beyond? And are we preparing ourselves for that? Where, when the tree falls, are we going to be? And so I want to again ask you, Let's talk about taking aim. An American writer has said, life begins when a person 
realizes how soon it will end. Um, I had a dream some years ago um, in which I picked up a magazine and the date on it was 2050. And I began doing some arithmetic and realizing that's coming up a lot quicker <laughs> than the few decades behind me. That's coming up quickly and I could very easily live to be a, to a rich old age, check out, be out a couple of years, come back, and in 2050, be in my 20s, as was the case. Interesting, the uh, Search for God material says this information will become textbooks for coming generations. And it says some of you, some of those that were preparing that Search for God material will be studying it in the next incarnation. And so in my dream of 2050, it begins, I'm in a little classroom talking with people about a Search for God group. And I say, uh, who's interested in this, such a group? A few hands went up. I said, okay, here comes the difficult part. When and where? And one of the students said, why don't we meet here tonight at 6 o'clock? So I wrote it on the chalkboard, left. And as I went out the door, I realized I didn't know who I was or where I was. And then I went up and saw this kiosk and saw this magazine. I picked it up, and that was the date, 2050. These trees are going to fall. Where are they going to lie? Where, where are we aiming? What are we shooting for? What is our ideal? What is our goal? And this time that we think passes so quickly, it's going to be like a watch in the night. So as we get a proper assessment of time, Casey says that uh, civilization as we understand it which has been at this level many times, many times. There were people that were given, there were at least two women were given incarnations 10 million years ago. Not in Homo sapiens, but some kind of hominid body, and they made markings on a wall in New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, that could still be seen today. And then if you go to <clears throat> Geological history, you find that 10 million years ago, things were pretty much the way they are. So when I think about a tree falling and lying, have you been to the petrified forest? Have you seen those trees? Do you understand that 240 million years ago, or is it thousands, 240,000 years ago, that was a tropical forest. And now, 7,000 feet, barren, there were dinosaurs up there. And we are much older than that. So what we want to do today is think about the opportunities. What, what are the opportunities that this easy way of life has given us? When I think about Maybe I was a pioneer coming across in a covered wagon. How did those people do it? One of the most sobering things I think about, and I guess it's because I was there, what was life like in England in the 1300s? Um, we've, we've been in all of these places, unimaginable, but today this incarnation is so gifted we're so so much that we have it's so wonderful what are we going to do with it are we going to use it as a stumbling block because it's easy and we just take an incarnation off like a day off or is this gift of this incarnation that's so glorious going to be a time for serious growth for us 
So what happens when the physical body puts aside? Casey has a number of words for this, none of which we can be very clear about. Where do we go when we transition? He speaks of the outer darkness. That's scary. And there's a story I want to tell you about that. There's a book, Testimony of Light, Helen Greaves, and who was a writer, Francis Banks, who was a Episcopalian nun, were friends. They said, whichever one of us dies first, try to get in touch with the spirit plane. So Francis Banks dies, Helen Greaves tunes in and starts writing about what Francis Banks is experiencing on the other side. And she has a job assignment. Her job is counseling with people who have died and need to be awakened. And she says, we had a most interesting patient come today. He was a Nazi war leader. And he feels like he's covered with boils and sores and everything because he feels this darkness. But he brought with him a 21-year-old Jewish woman who held him responsible for the death of her husband and child. And she has been with him in this darkness these many years because of her anger toward him. So when you think about where the tree falls, First thing is forgiveness. We have to forgive. We have to forgive ourselves. We have to forgive those of whom we think the least or those who caused us the most pain. Why? Why was this Jewish woman with this Nazi war criminal? Because where our thoughts are is where our vibrations are. And if our thoughts our own hatred, then that's where the vibrations go and that's where we find ourselves in consciousness. As a tree falls, if you fall and you're bitterly angry, then you attach yourself to the vibrations, perhaps, of that one which you're angry. So I tell people, if you're angry with someone, maybe a friend, be careful because next time they may be a brother. And if you're still angry, the next time they may be a spouse. (laughs) So you want to be very careful about those with whom you attach yourself. So Casey speaks of the outer darkness, the borderland, the interbetween, the other side, God's at the door, and planetary sojourns in other realms. Where are we going to go? Well, we're going to go where we aim. So, what do we meet on the other side? We've all heard about the near-death experiences. People see loved ones and they rejoice. They don't want to come back. They like it over there. And I've been thinking about that because I don't think everyone who dies necessarily has this beautiful encounter. And what's occurred to me is I imagine a a soldier coming back from some horrendous battles. He's so glad to be back. The family's so glad to be back. They have a gathering. They are excited about it at a turn. There's a rejoicing like the near-death experience when you get on the other side. But then, after the celebration, life sets in. There's the pain from the injuries. There's the post-traumatic stress disorder. There's difficulty getting a job, dealing with family. I don't think it's all sweetness and light on the other side, even if in that immediate transition we love this new experience. Why? We still have, we're still ourselves. We still have to meet ourselves. The church has promised us once you die, if you're a believer, you have a perfected body. K. 
Casey says, this is not necessarily so. So forgiving. The next thing, taking charge of our mind. What the mind dwells upon. We become, and it's that with which we will be possessed in the spirit plane. So taking charge of the mind. Shortly after um, Anne was making contact with her son Stephen, he said, uh, what I think about is where I go. If I think about being with you, I'm with you. If I think about something else, I'm there. He said, the hard thing is to take charge of my mind and keep it focused on where I want to be. And in those realms, there is no limitation of space. You can instantaneously be on the planet Mars or Jupiter or somewhere else. Taking charge of the mind. The Tibetans say a mind is like a wild horse. You have to chain it down. Casey says the key, the key is compelling, requiring, inducing the mind to dwell upon the ideal. So when the tree falls, is it going to fall with bitterness and anger or self-centeredness about your pain? Or will it fall seeking for the light or seeking for a, a brighter companionship or seeking for the master? The Tibetan Book of the Dead, addressing the problems that are called the Pardo, says there are planes and experiences through which the soul needs to move. When Casey was giving reading, he sensed a, a dot of light and a beam of light that he had to follow. And he said if he didn't, he would be distracted because there were people in motion and such on either side. He said, Unless I follow the light, I'll get off, I'll get lost. So the Tibetan Book of the Dead says, O nobly born, addressing the soul, go toward the light. Don't get caught up with these illusions and things that are on the other side. So when the tree falls, when we transition, we need to go toward the light. And we were talking this morning in the group what a new concept this is. Almost everyone now understands that. 50, 60 years ago, no one would tell the dying person, look to the light. But the secret, the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead, decades ago written, look for the light. And then I found this fascinating. He said, you'll see two lights. There'll be a greater light and a lesser light. You'll be drawn toward the lesser light because it seems less painful, but go toward the greater light. So when the tree falls, have in mind, look for the light. What about the purpose when we get on the other side? Rob Schwartz has, been a, has written about our purposes. Um, Shanti Devi, she was written about in the mid-30s. She, as a seven-year-old remembered her past life and had verified details about those memories. When we were on a trip around the world in 69, we met her and asked her about these past life memories. She said, that pales from what I experienced in the spirit plane. I met with the Lord Krishna and he told me an assignment I was to come back as a teacher. So the, the idea is as we, as we fall, as we transition to seek an understanding of a higher purpose about which Rob Schwartz has written in this soul's purpose. What are we aspiring to? The woman who actually was the source of the book, There's a River, that I read in 1951. She was um, practicing, she was 70, practicing to be an opera singer. 
and her opera teacher was promising her a debut in Europe. And I thought that's really unfair of him. And then I got a bigger picture of it. She, she is probably now an opera star. See, she, she is preparing herself for a subsequent incarnation. If you want the tree to fall in a good direction, now's the time to start building that which you desire. Because that which you desire, that which you dwell upon, is what you're going to become and that with which we will have to deal in other incarnations. And on the other hand, there's an interesting story. Casey gave a reading for a woman. He said she was responsible for developing the horse, as we understand it, that is so useful to us from, from a smaller to a working animal and said that was a great gain but in her later years she saw some young men riding and enjoying riding horseback that her desire went out to be like that to ride like that in the next incarnation she spent her life as a cowboy in a menial work this desire so strong that it set her up for an ordinary life instead of the um, uh, exceptional life that she previously led. Where's our tree going to fall with respect to our desires? What are we desiring to do or to become? One of the things we want to address is from what might be called addiction addiction to politics or football or tobacco or alcohol or drugs or sex. <clears throat> Those things with which we might be possessed. All of you saw the movie Ghost with uh, Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze. And there's a scene in the subway where a discarnate is really angry and he's banging on the cigarette dispenser because he wants a smoke and he can't. See, the, the death of the physical body doesn't mean the death of those physical desires. So as we think about where the tree falls, let's address what are our desires? What are our addictions? How can I be sure that I don't carry those with me? Because what Casey says about this Imagine this man in the subway wanting a smoke. Casey says, you can burn and burn and burn. See, the, the burning is unquenched desires, un, unsatisfied desires that are not for our higher good. So how to prepare for this transition we can practice. Casey says, sleep is but a shadow of that state we call death. So as you fall asleep, it's like practicing to transition. The first thing we want to do as we fall asleep is a prayer of protection. David used it earlier this morning. Casey, we find it in several places, but the wording goes like this. Father, as I open myself to the unseen forces that surround the throne of grace, beauty, and might, I throw about myself the protection found in the thought of the Christ. So that's, that's the prayer of protection. And remember, the prayer is not what protects you. It's the spirit that protects you. So you say the prayer and then you sense his promise. As I open myself to the unseen forces that surround the throne of grace, beauty, and might. Well, what are these unseen forces? They may be physiological. They may be in the surroundings. But as you fall asleep, practice where the tree falls with a prayer of protection. And then 
I like to do the 23rd Psalm and Lord's Prayer. And what I find is I get about halfway through and I forget where I was. So we, we need to catch ourselves and say, I need to take control of my mind. At least I can get through the 23rd Psalm. And I think these, these two, I call them archetypal prayers, are actually uh, Christian mantras. These, the, the mantra is something that the mind dwells upon that creates and brings into reality. And for, when we say, thine is the kingdom and the power, that power we want to be flowing through us as the Christ power. So the, we fall asleep, we take a direction, we set the ideal. Always, after you say the prayer protection, review your ideal. An example. And Casey, uh, the readings, especially the Search for God, encourage us to think of being channels. I want to be a pure and proactive channel for the manifestation of the Christ Spirit in the, with those with whom I have to deal. To manifest the love of God through this Spirit of Christ. So as you fall asleep, set the ideal, say the prayer protection, say those attuning mantras, and then you can ask this question, what do I want to do tonight? You can ask, Lord, is there something I need to learn? Send me to those realms of learning. Is there someone I can help? I've told you this story of Olga Warrell. She was contacted in the middle of the night by an angel, tugged at her and says, come with me. She went and she found herself in a church and there was a priest there that she knew and what had happened is he had um, been scheduled to speak at that church the next day and on the way that night was killed in an automobile accident. So the angel took her and he recognized Olga. So Olga was able to take him toward the light. And she went back and then the angel tugs on her again and says, come with me. And this time in front of the church, the, the priest's wife was wandering. She was confused, she was lost. And so Olga was able, because the woman could recognize her, to take her to the light. So there are many stories of people who in dreams, in the spirit plane, have been able to go out and be of help to others. So first you say, is there something I need to learn? Is there someone that I can be of help? Is there some past life gift that I built for myself that I can remember during the sleep? And Casey says, there are many. We have earned, say you want to be a musician. You can awaken that pattern from a past life in which you may have been a genius or a painter or what have you. So, and, and there's hardly any dream that doesn't have some past life component. So perhaps there's a gift. There may be a warning, a, a dream, a precognitive dream, or a warning, or a promise of something. Or simply a place of beauty, of attunement, and, and rejoicing, and so on. So as you fall asleep, then say, Lord, if there's someone I can help, send me. If there's something I need to learn, and, and ask to be directed. It, you don't program the dream, but you send articulate a desire for a constructive experience. And then, of course, when you awaken, you want to record that because those things are so elusive. Three minutes, it's gone. Here's an English proverb from 1678. As a tree falls, so shall it lie. As a man lives, so shall he die. As a man dies, so shall he be. Alas, 
through all the eons of eternity. Now that's what the church teaches. What we're teaching is, as a tree falls, it doesn't have to lie there, but we want it to fall in a place that we can wake up from and remember and get on with it because there's this wonderful continuity of life. And, you know, Dennis Aminis said the problem with re reincarnation is you might have to come back as yourself. <laughs> That's it. John Barrymore, a great actor of the 19, 19, tw the 20th century and 1900s. One is not old until regrets take the place of dreams. One is not old until regrets take the place of dreams. We need to forgive ourselves with the regrets. Have you fulfilled your sole purpose? Nobody has. See, don't, don't get upset because you haven't fulfilled your purpose, soul purpose. That's why the subsequent incarnations, that's why the continuity of life. It's a continuing thing. We have, we have a lot of growing. We have more growing to do than the church would have us believe. You, get, you can't just say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, my personal Savior, and count on it taking you immediately to the arms of the all-loving God. One is not old till one regrets, one's regrets take the place of dreams. And then C.S. Lewis says, one is never too old to dream a new dream. Before the tree falls for each of us, which will be quicker than we imagine, let's dream a new dream. <laughs> At one month with the Lord, at one month with the love, as this 13th chapter, 1 Corinthians says, love, the greatest of all. This should be our direction. We want to become more and more loving because God is love and we want to be in attunement with that aspiration. So, Casey says, there really will be a thousand years of peace. And he tells that study group, be ye all determined to be in that number. We, we want to move toward being one with those who are bringing light to the world. And never too old to dream a new dream, but the tree may fall sooner than we imagine. God bless you.